Hi, folks. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks very much for, for dropping me in it, my, uh, <laughs> my introduction there. It's, um, it's a great honor to share a platform with you. So it's, uh, it's great to see a PhD student going on uh, and making a success of his research. OK, so I want to talk about zero-hours contracts. Uh, and zero-hours contracts are essentially, there's a bunch of definitions floating around, which is slight variation in those definitions. But essentially, these are contracts um, that don't guarantee any hours. Okay, how do I make that bigger? That's it, okay. All right, um, you know, we talk about zero hours contracts a lot, right? This is a hot topic in the media. Uh, in particular, The Guardian love talking about zero hours contracts. Uh, so these are, these are just some kind of random headlines on zero hours contracts in the last year or two. Uh, it's also talked about in Northern Ireland media. This is an issue in Northern Ireland as, as, uh, as elsewhere, okay? Uh, so we're going to talk, we're going to look behind one or two of these headlines uh, in what time we have today. Okay. All right, so what are we going to talk about? Um, so these are the kind of questions that I want to raise, uh, so it serves as an outline of the talk as well. Okay. So what do we really know about zero-hours contract growth? Okay. Uh, it's widely believed, and I'll show you a picture coming up in a minute, uh, that there's been a growth in prevalence of zero-hours contracts over the last five, ten years or so, but what do we really know uh, about their growth? Um, who are the ZHC workers uh, and where do they work? Okay. Uh, and what do we know about ZHC prevalence specifically here in Northern Ireland? Okay. Um, so the answer turns out to be not that much, but a little bit. Okay. Um, and then what do we know about the quality of ZHC jobs? So this is not just about counting ZHC jobs. This is uh, this is thinking about the impacts of taking a ZHC job on you as a worker. Um, we can also think about the impacts on firms and why firms offer these kinds of jobs. But I want to particularly focus about a couple of issues to do with ZHC impacts on workers. Okay? Uh, now, there are lots of impacts you could think about uh, you know, on overall well-being, on uh, financial security, uh, on career development pathways and so on. I'm just going to focus on two, uh, and all of those are interesting questions, right? Um, but I'm just going to focus on two today, uh, and that's whether there's a wage penalty or a wage premium to taking a ZHC job as opposed to a job under some other type of employment contract, and a kind of catch-all measure of job quality, uh, which is becoming widely used in the international literature, which is job satisfaction. So do zero-hours contract workers report lower job satisfaction than otherwise similar workers in different sorts of jobs? Okay. Uh, this is from the Office for National Statistics. It's based on labour force survey data. Okay? Uh, it's for the UK. And what it shows you is the number of people reporting um, that they're working on a zero-hours contract job. Okay? It's from the labour force survey, so it's self-reported information. Yes, I'm, I do a zero-hours contract job. And then they just, the ONS just scale it up to the, to the level of the population. Okay? So this is their... Uh, the estimate based on what people say about what they actually do, what type of job they hold, uh, this is the best estimate the ONS has from the LFS on the prevalence of zero-hours contracts at the UK level over this time period. There's a few things to notice from this. Uh, first of all, zero-hours contracts, we didn't just invent them a few years ago. Right? They've been around for years. Okay? Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of zero-hours contracts according to this uh, data source back in 2000, okay? Other data suggests that zero-hours contracts were around in the 90s as well. I don't know exactly when they started, but they're not recent, okay? They've been around for a while. Uh, what else do we notice? We notice huge growth, right? Uh, starting around, what's that, 2012. Uh, you know, well, the growth kind of started in 2010, but in particular picked up in 2012, and then very rapid growth, 2012 to 13. Uh, and that hasn't stopped, okay? So we have continuing rapid growth according to the LFS data, okay, at the UK level. Now, what else do we notice? Uh, we know we've just been through a big recession, right, 2008-9. Uh, um, we don't see a strong kind of cyclical pattern here. This doesn't seem that, you know, you might imagine in a recession uh, there's more pressure in the labour market, the labour market's a bit slacker, maybe there's an increase in prevalence of zero-hours contracts while demand for workers is lower. We don't really see that, right? It doesn't seem to be tied to the booms and busts of the economy here. Okay. Now, the ONS uh, are very clear that they think 
the LFS, the labour force survey data on which this graph is based, underestimate zero hours contracts prevalence. Okay? And their argument is essentially that if you ask someone, uh, you know, what type of contract are you on, maybe not everybody will realise they're on a zero hours contract, even if they are on a zero hours contract. You know, this definition of zero hours contract, uh, it, it, it's not dissimilar to other types of labels that we give other types of contracts, like casual contracts or like on-call contracts. And there are thousands of people in these surveys that would tick the on-call contract box who may, you know, who somebody else might think, well, they're on a zero-hours contract, who might tick the casual box instead of the zero-hours contract, but maybe they, they could be counted as being on a zero-hours contract, okay? So the ONS say, you've got to be really careful. Uh, they kind of say, if you put up a crazy chart like this, don't just believe the line shows you what we think it shows us, okay? In particular, uh, they talk about the increased media attention uh, that kind of, you know, we've seen some of those headlines, right, in the previous slide. But this sort of peak in media attention that happened starting around 2013, okay? Uh, and zero hours contracts have been very prevalent in the news, uh, you know, since then. And is, you know, when you're thinking about people ticking a box in a survey as to whether they're on a zero hours contract, and maybe some people not really realising exactly whether they're on a zero hours contract or not, because maybe they don't call it that, they call it something else. Once zero hours contracts are very, you know, uh, are in the news all the time, maybe they're more likely to tick that box, okay? So maybe this uptick that we see, have I got a layer? Yeah, there we go. This uptick, right, that we see here, maybe that's partly the result of increased awareness of zero hours contracts being a box that we could tick in one of these surveys, okay? And the ONS are very careful to, to you know, don't jump to conclusions when we see pictures like this, okay? Um, so, also, the ONS, they don't say there's been no growth in zero hours contracts. Uh, they say probably there has been some growth in the prevalence of zero hours contracts, but it's very hard to quantify because we have this increased awareness kind of issue going on at the same time. I played around with this a bit. Um, Actually, before I get to that, I just want to say the ONS also argued that we probably still underestimate the prevalence of zero hours contracts using this LFS data. Okay? So even now we've got up to something like 900,000, we're probably still underestimating their prevalence. Okay? This is, uh, I didn't realise you could do this. I've, I've seen people do it, but I didn't realise how easy it was. Right? So you can go, uh, you just go to Google Trends uh, and you put in your search parameters that you want and you can get data on. Uh, how many searches uh, have, have been logged on Google for particular search terms, right? Uh, over a long period of time, you can restrict the geography or whatever. So, so I did this for UK searches for zero-hours contracts going back to 2004, and they give you, uh, you know, basically the number of uh, Google searches for the phrase zero-hours contracts, okay? It's not quite a number. It's in index form. So the, so the big spike here, they give that a value of 100, so everything's relative to that big spike, Okay. So there's not many searches along here. And then we come to, what's this? This is January, you know, just around the very beginning of 2013, okay? Big jump, all right? And this is, this, you know, this is not a perfect measure of awareness, but it's some kind of proxy for kind of widespread awareness of this concept of zero hours contracts, okay? And we can see that there's a big jump here, right? Then there's a very big jump here, which is, this, is, uh, this coincides with the UK general election. Okay, it's, that, it's the month of April 2015, uh, where this was quite a big issue and, and there were various policy proposals around. Um, so the question is, what, you know, so one question is, right, if we want to look behind this ONS uh, discussion about, well, we don't know what came first, zero hours contracts growth or growth in awareness that's kind of driving reported growth in zero hours contracts, put the two together. Unfortunately, we still don't know, right? So, um, so the kind of the, the strange orange bars, are, that's this, okay? But remember, these days, although it looks like a smooth line, it's just annual snapshots, right, that take place for the fourth quarter of each year. We count how many people say they're on zero-hours contracts in the labor force survey. So these are annual snapshots. Uh, this is more like continuous time data. But if you put those two things together, you can see that... that Growth in the, in the reported prevalence of zero-hours contracts does begin before the growth in Google searches, which is our proxy for awareness, okay? But the real big jump kind of happens now, right? It, it kind of happens at the same time, let's put it like that, as this first big spike in searches, as this first big spike in awareness. 
It looks here like it happens just after, but that's because we're just counting this at one particular point in time in the year. So all we know is that the numbers change from this to this at some stage between those two bars. Okay? So we still don't really know, uh, and we just don't count zero-hours contracts in, uh, frequently enough in, in the labor force survey to really break this down any further. Okay? So we still don't really know. Um, this big spike here didn't seem to lead to a big spike in reported zero-hours contracts. So, the, you know, so I guess you know, this doesn't give us the answer. Uh, we know that there's some growth that doesn't seem to be preceded by growth in awareness, and we know that there's a, some growth that does seem to be preceded by growth in awareness. Okay? So I don't know, we're none the wiser, but we have some numbers. Okay. All right. Uh, who are the zero-hours contracts workers? Uh, they're skewed towards females. Okay, uh, and we know this already, right? Um, so this is just ONS, uh, ONS stuff. This is all for the UK. Uh, the young people, predominantly, all right? Uh, and then again, uh, you find people, uh, older workers, uh, are disproportionately in zero-hours contract jobs. And again, you might think about reasons why um, those kinds of jobs may be more appealing for those kinds of workers or more available for those kinds of workers. Um, where are they in terms of, we've been hearing about occupational classes, so in terms of uh, just like a, a nine class occupational stratification here, where do we find zero hours contracts? Here and here. Well, first of all, we find them everywhere, okay? So even, uh, you know, in these kind of higher level classes here, we're seeing you know, zero hours contracts. There was some, some news, I think it was just before Christmas, about the extent to which universities employ people on these kinds of contracts. For example, Queen's, uh, you know, was mentioned in some of that media coverage. Um, and, you know, but predominantly uh, we see, you know, big chunks of zero hours contract workers in these two groups here. And together, these make up something like, uh, I think the figure is around 60% of the zero hours contracts reported in the labor force survey, okay? So again, all of these numbers are probably underestimates, okay? Because they're based on these people ticking a box in the survey about the type of contract that they do. Uh, in terms of industry, uh, which industries use zero hours contracts most? Um, again, we can see, you know, this is, uh, this is not an even spread, right? They are disproportionately in accommodation of food, right? Hotels, catering, uh, health and social work. Uh, again, this is from the LFS, so these may be un underestimates, okay? Uh, and so on and so on, right? Um, here, there are, some, there are some other estimates floating around. Uh, there's, there's one in particular, uh, there was a study commissioned by the Low Pay Commission into domiciliary care workers. And they used administrative data uh, for the domiciliary care sector in, in England. And they came up with a figure. So you'd, you'd think that these data are going to be accurate, right? And they're not going to suffer from the same self-reported kind of measurement issues that the Labour Force Survey data come from. But it's for a very specific uh, sector at a specific time. Uh, and they come up with a figure that something like in 2012, more than 50%, I think it was 56% of workers uh, in the domiciliary care sector uh, in England were on zero hours contracts, okay? Uh, and those guys are found in here, right? But this is nowhere near 56%, okay? So, it, you know, so the LFS seems to be, it does seem to be underestimating when we compare it to other estimates like this administrative data for that particular sector, uh, you know, we do see an underestimate, okay? All right. What do we know about the prevalence of zero-hours contracts in Northern Ireland? Uh, so when I first started hunting for this, this was what I found. Uh, okay, so uh, again, this is based on the Labour Force Survey, and this is reported by the ONS. Uh, you basically, you get, you get estimates for all the other, all the other regions, but you, just, you get a blank for Northern Ireland, okay? And this is because the sample size in Northern Ireland in the Labour Force Survey is small enough, and there are few enough people that say they're on zero-hours contracts that the ONS don't want to report them because of disclosure issues, okay? Um, so they don't report them. And we should also note these stars, right? So the, so the convention in kind of, uh, you know, uh, academic economics is, is the more stars, the better, right? The more stars, the more precise our estimate, the less margin of error there is around the estimate. But here it's the more stars, the worse, okay? So, uh, so one star here means that actually uh, the ONS think this is a pretty good estimate, right? And we can be pretty sure that that's pretty much bang on, right? At least given those, 
uh, the fact that the, the LFS underestimates, you know, accepting that. Uh, and that's because, big sample, big sample. Once we start moving into smaller regions with smaller samples, we start to get much bigger margins of error around these estimates, okay? Uh, so that should be, boring, you know, bear that in mind. You know, we don't really know that 2.9 is any different from 3.1 here, okay? But we do see a regional pattern in the prevalence of zero-hours contracts. Okay, uh, we made some progress this year. So now we get a figure, okay? So the ONS does report an estimate uh, uh, for the prevalence of zero-hours contracts uh, in Northern Ireland. So it's 16,000, um, or 1.9% of, what is it, a uh, percent of people in employment. 1.9% uh, of people who are in employment say they're on a zero-hours contract, right, in the Labour Force Survey in Northern Ireland, okay? So it's smaller uh, than many of these figures here. In fact, it's smaller than all of these figures here, but it comes with lots of stars, which means, you know, the ONS say, you know, take this with a pinch of salt. This is what we've got as the estimate, but we can't really, you know, we can't be sure that it's 1.9. I think we can be sure that it's positive, right? We know that the number's bigger than zero, but um, you know, there's a wide confidence interval or margin of error around this number. Okay. But at least we've got something, right? We've got a number on the board, which is more than we had, you know, looking back a couple of years. Uh, I just did this quickly, so, uh, you know, to get, a, to get another kind of estimate, think back to this, right, at the UK level, we know that the uh, zero-hours contracts are much more prevalent in some sectors than, other, than others, okay? We, we know in Northern Ireland, uh, you know, the contribution, the number of jobs in different sectors. Put the two things together, and you can extrapolate from the UK uh, distribution of zero-hours contracts by sector to the Northern Ireland kind of industry mix, and you can get another estimate that way, okay? When you do that, you come up with something that's very similar, okay? You know, forget the fact that, oh, what did I do there? Forget the fact that I've got, you know, decimal places and all that stuff here. Just ignore that. These, this is very kind of back of the envelope, rough and ready numbers. But the number is, uh, you know, so if you do this, so you extrapolate from the UK at an industry level to the Northern Ireland labour market, you get a pretty similar number. It's around 20,000, okay? There's a big margin of error on this too. And this likely underestimates, just like the 16,000 likely underestimates, because it's all based on the same labour force survey data. Okay. All right, um, what about zero hours contracts and wages? So let's think about impacts on workers. This is, uh, this is a table from a TUC report that came out a couple of years ago. And it shows uh, average gross weekly pay. Uh, it's not so interesting because zero hours contracts workers tend to work part-time hours, okay? So um, you'd, you'd imagine they're gonna have less lower gross weekly pay than full-time permanent contract workers. But the thing that's more interesting is to look at hourly pay, okay? You've got two measures here. You've got the mean and you've got the median. Uh, this is probably the best one to look at, uh, although they both tell you the same thing. What they tell you is that zero-hours contract workers receive lower hourly wages than workers on other sorts of employment contracts. Okay? Again, it's probably no surprise. Okay? But what we really want to know is we want to know, you know, can we explain this with other, with, you know, zero-hours contracts are not the same. Zero-hours contracts workers are not the same uh, as workers uh, on other types of employment contracts. We saw that they're very young on average, right? We saw that they're more likely to be women, uh, and they're in different kind of sectors and occupations to, to, to workers on other occupations, uh, other types of contracts, okay? So what you want to do is you want to wash out those differences. So you want to compare like with like. So for a person of given age, uh, of given gender, uh, and so on, given education level. Uh, if that person's in a zero-hours contract job, what's their hourly wage? And if that person's in, a, in another sort of employment contract, what's their hourly wage? You want to compare people that are similar uh, according to the, you know, age and gender and so on, okay? This doesn't do this. So this is just a raw difference, okay? So it's got, it's got the facts that maybe there's a wage premium or wage penalty to zero-hours contract jobs uh, muddled up with all the differences between zero-hours contract workers and other workers, okay? So you want to wash those out. Uh, right? And I'm an economist, right? So we love doing regressions, okay? Uh, so how do you wash this kind of thing out? You, you do it using a, a multivariate regression, okay? So you, you buy some statistical software. Uh, you can do it in Excel, right? And you, you put the data in, uh, and you try and wash out these differences in age, differences in gender, and those kind of things to see, you know, what's left in terms of a difference between zero-hour contract workers, hourly wages, and, and other contract workers. Uh, and luckily, the Resolution Foundation have just done this. This came out uh, just before Christmas. Um, 
So, uh, and you, I'm, I'm not sure the report's out yet, but you can find there's a link in the research briefing as part of this uh, where you can go to the press release, and the press release is quite detailed. So the, recent, so the Resolution Foundation find that zero-hours contract workers earn 38% less per hour than permanent employees, right? That's just the same as this figure here, right? That's just the raw difference, okay? But what they do that the TUC didn't do is they, they, they do this kind of regression analysis and they say we can explain four-fifths of this gap by differences in other characteristics that are linked to wages, right? You know, the fact that zero-hours contract workers are more likely to be young, they're more likely to be female, et cetera, et cetera. Once you wash those differences out, you explain away 80% of that gap, but there's still a gap, okay? And the gap is essentially one pound per hour, okay? So once we wash out all the differences that we can using data, there may be other differences that we can't wash out using data. You know, maybe zero-hours contracts uh, workers have unobservable differences to do with motivation or, or ability that we can't wash out using data on education and stuff, right? Maybe they don't. Um, but this is like the best estimate we have at the moment of the wage penalty uh, or premium uh, for being on a zero-hours contract job, okay? Compared to similar workers being on other sorts of jobs, all right? And what you can see is it's a wage penalty, right? It's a wage penalty. It's a pound an hour. All right? For a typical zero-hours contract worker working 21 hours per week, the Resolution Foundation gives us this nice uh, memorable number, which this, this adds up to £1,000 a year, right? Uh, lower earnings than they would have working the same number of hours with the same kind of characteristics, but in a job that wasn't a zero-hours contract job. Okay? So it's a wage penalty. Now, this is not obvious, right, uh, that it should be a wage penalty. Think about, you know, how do, how do we explain this? There are different potential explanations to this. Um, one of the arguments that's often made about zero-hours contract uh, jobs is that they offer an attractive element of flexibility for the worker, okay? So you're not obliged uh, to take particular hours or particular shifts, so there's some flexibility. And for some workers, that may be very attractive, okay? It may be so attractive that you're willing to accept lower hourly wages in order to get that nice flexibility, okay? Uh, that's one potential explanation for why you would get a wage penalty here, all right? You would accept lower wages to give you that flexibility. Essentially, you're buying the extra flexibility with a lower wage, okay? There's another explanation, uh, which is very different and would have very different policy implications. Uh, and I don't know what the explanation is, right? I'm just going to throw the, the potential explanations out there, which is that some people... Uh, are kind of stuck in zero-hours contract jobs, or they, they may not have access to other sorts of jobs. Uh, so it may not really be about, uh, you know, unconstrained choice. It may be that because of your caring responsibilities or because uh, your skills and experience are in one of these sectors where zero-hours contracts have become very, very prevalent, or for whatever reason, it may be that other types of jobs may not be accessible to you, uh, and you're kind of stuck in here. Uh, you know, so, so really, what, you know, if the labour market mo you know, worked like we teach our undergraduate economic students, uh, you know, everybody would leave these jobs and, and go to a job that didn't have this pay penalty, right? Um, you know, that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, so, so maybe there's this other explanation that the, the labour market, uh, you know, it's not all parts of the labour market are available to all workers, okay? Uh, a kind of segmented labour market kind of story. And, the, the, you know, the real answer is we don't know. We don't know what's behind this pay penalty, okay? It could be either of those things. Or it could be a bit of both for different kinds of zero-hour contract workers, okay? All right. Um, it's an interesting question, right? One way we can maybe get a handle on that is by thinking about job satisfaction. So if it was the first story, right, where uh, actually zero-hour contract workers uh, find the flexibility very attractive, therefore they're willing to accept a lower wage in order to get that flexibility, then they, then they should report the same level of job satisfaction as other workers. They shouldn't say that my job, you know, it gives me less satisfaction than another worker in another type of contract, okay? Uh, so it shouldn't look like an inferior job when we ask people to say, how satisfied are you with your job? All things considered, okay? If it's the other story, uh, the, the story about constraints and not being able to access other types of jobs, uh, then maybe you'd expect zero-hours contracts to report lower levels of job satisfaction, right, than, they, than, than workers in other types of contracts. Uh, so we can look at this, and this is, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of research about this with, with different sorts of contingent employment contract internationally, you know, casual work, agency work, 
part-time work against full-time permanent work and so on, temporary work. Um, but there isn't really much evidence on specifically on zero-hours contract jobs. What we do know internationally is that these kinds of, you, know, you could call them precarious jobs, but these kinds of contingent jobs, sort of non-permanent, non-standard jobs, if you like, tend, uh, workers in those kinds of jobs tend to report lower levels of job satisfaction. Okay, so in particular, I'm thinking about casual jobs and agency jobs, like temp agency jobs, okay? Um, and in particular, men uh, tend to report lower levels of job satisfaction internationally, okay? Now, sometimes the differences in reported job satisfaction are not that big. Some studies find bigger differences. Some studies find smaller differences, okay? But there tends to be uh, lower levels of reported job satisfaction in these kinds of uh, contingent type jobs, okay? But nobody's really done this for zero-hours contracts except there is one existing estimate uh, by the CPD in 2013. Uh, so, um, and it's the only published estimate I can find for job satisfaction for zero hours contracts, okay? And it essentially, in their, they run a survey once a year, and in their survey, it's, it's a fairly small sample survey. They just had a question which was, uh, it was dichotomous. So, so I, I, I forget exactly what the options were, but, you know, overall, how, how, how satisfied are you with your job? Satisfied or not satisfied? It's something like that, okay? Whereas normally in surveys, uh, you know, it's a kind of scale of 1 to 10 or something like that, so you can get finer gradation, okay? So if you just ask people whether they're satisfied or not satisfied, full stop, uh, as they did in this survey, there was no difference or no statistically significant difference for zero-hours contract workers compared to workers on other contracts, okay? Um, now, I don't want to make too much of that because this is just one estimate and there are issues with this estimate given sample size and given the very blunt measure of job satisfaction they used. Um, but there's nothing huge jumping out from that particular estimate. I've done some preliminary estimates with a co-author of mine, uh, Colin Green at the University of Lancaster, using British household panel study data. Now, these data go back to the 90s and there was a question in that survey about zero-hours contracts. It suffers from all the problems that the Labour Force survey suffers from in underestimating or undercounting these kinds of zero-hours contracts and more so, uh, probably, okay? There are very small numbers of people who say they're on zero-hours contracts in these BHPS data. But the BHPS also has job satisfaction and the Labour Force survey doesn't have job satisfaction, okay, uh, data. So when you look at this in the BHPS, Again, you find a penalty. You find that zero hours contract, or workers who say in the BHPS back in the 90s that they were on zero hours contracts do tend to report lower levels of job satisfaction. Okay? But the difference is not great. And the difference is not as big. So they're not much, much lower levels of job satisfaction. All, right? all those caveats bearing in mind, all those caveats about the data quality and undercounting and stuff. And the difference that we find is smaller than the, than the, than the job satisfaction penalty of being an agency worker for example, okay? So, you know, it doesn't look like from those, they're, they're preliminary regressions that, you know, I wouldn't want to put too much weight on them, but it doesn't look like zero-hours contract look, look way worse than, uh, than other types of contingent employment contract um, in terms of job satisfaction. But it's early days, uh, and we need to do more. Okay, uh, so these questions, right, you know, uh, it's the last day today, right, of the assembly. Uh, and there are other things going on, okay? I'm aware of that. There's Brexit. Oh, there's Brexit going on, right? So I'm aware of that. So, so maybe this is not top of everybody's agenda right now, right? But these questions are not going to go away. These issues are not going to go away, okay? Uh, and these questions matter for workers who are on zero-hours contracts, for workers who may end up on zero-hours contracts. They matter for employers, okay? We can't just go jumping in there legislating left, right, and centre here because zero-hours contracts... Uh, can be very useful for employers who face volatile demand, right? We have to think about this. Uh, and they matter for government, okay? Um, in particular, you know, if you look at the, 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 the program for government or the draft program for government, there's stuff that is really in this space, okay? So, so outcome six, this better, you know, more and better jobs, okay? We want more jobs, but we also want better jobs. Are zero-hours contracts good jobs or poor jobs? That's part of what we've been talking about today. We don't really know, Okay. Um, but they come with job insecurity, for example, compared to some other jobs. Uh, they may come with more flexibility. You know, workers, are workers trading off the good aspects and bad aspects of these types of job contracts? Or are they stuck <laughs> in these kinds of inferior jobs and they'd rather be doing uh, working under other sorts of contracts, right? We don't really know this, but it matters for policy, right? Um, you know, with, uh, you know in, the, in the draft program for government, there's this proposed better jobs index. And there are a bunch of kind of measures that you might use to build up a better jobs index. 
and I look, all of them seem to be uh, relevant to zero hours contracts, right? It's things like job security. It's things like progressing uh, through your career, right? These are all big issues uh, for which zero hours contracts and more information about zero hours contracts is important, okay? Um, the bottom line there, uh, you know, uh, we know I've, I've not been working on zero hours contracts for very long. This is something I've just started getting interested in in the last year or so. Um, and we know enough about zero hours contracts to know that there are lots of unanswered questions, all right? And these are important questions. How do we move forward uh, in Northern Ireland? I've just made a few suggestions. It, look, there are, there are loads of potential policy interventions we might make. You know, in other parts of the world, uh, workers on contracts like zero hours contracts uh, get an hourly pay, you know, in law, an hourly pay premium of 20% or 25% in Australia, for example, right? Uh, south of the border, uh, there are contracts a bit like this where even if you don't get any hours in a particular week, you still get paid a proportion of your usual hours, okay? You know, there, there, are, there must be things that, you know, there are possible interventions to do with notice periods about shifts and so on, exclusivity, uh, right? So there are lots of potential interventions. But let's make them based on the best knowledge we can, right? And there are gaps in our knowledge at the moment. Uh, how can we move forward? Can we make better use of existing data? Uh, can we add questions, uh, a question or questions about zero-hours contracts and other non-standard job types to existing surveys in Northern Ireland? Let's not set up a new survey, but can we just tweak existing surveys, add one or two questions here and there? Um, you know, to, to get more information. First of all, about whether they're growing, right? The ONS, as well as having the labour force survey where people report whether they're on zero hours contracts or not, they also uh, survey employers and they ask employers where, you know, how many zero hours contracts uh, workers do they have, okay? Uh, and you can see from those data that have been running a few years, those surveys, that there's growth in zero hours contracts prevalence according to employers, okay? And maybe employers are more more consistently aware of the types of contracts that they're hiring people under than, than if we're kind of reporting whether we're zero hours contract workers or not, okay? Can we do that here in Northern Ireland? That's going to give us another estimate uh, of the prevalence of zero hours contracts here. Even if we can count the number of zero hours contract workers and who they are and where they are in Northern Ireland, can we learn more about the quality of zero hours contract jobs? All I've really, do, all I've really done is raise some questions today, right? Uh, I haven't really been able to give you any definitive answers just because there aren't any. Okay, but these are important questions. Uh, and we know how to do it, right? Uh, so can we learn more about the quality of zero hours contract jobs and their impacts on workers? Can we build an evidence base uh, so that the assembly, so that the executive can think about policy in this space based on better evidence? I think the answer to all three questions is yes. Okay, thank you.